Thank you for your interest here at North Hills, where we are more than Sunday. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our ministries, you can always visit us online at north-hills.org. Now join us as Pastor James delivers his message. Well, I love a good story. I don't know about you, but stories just come alive for me. I love to read. And for me, the best stories in the world are ones that you read and you become engrossed in that story, that you become a part of that story, so much so that you can say that you have fought the rebellion with Luke Skywalker, or you have sailed the seas on the Pequod with Ishmael. For me, a story that, that I loved as a kid, that I read, and I just kind of read, and it's one of the only books that I've ever read multiple times, it was a book called Ender's Game. And some of you may have read it, but it was a book that just, I was just so caught up in it that I became a part of that story, and it really had a huge impact on my life. That I traveled the galaxy with Ender. I remember other stories, I remember sitting at the feet of my grandfather, listening to him tell stories about what it was like growing up in the Great Depression and feeling the dirt on my bare feet. I remember feeling the hunger of not knowing where your next meal is gonna come from. I remember being engrossed in that story and seeing just how far he had come from being born into nothing, into poverty, to raise himself up, to be a business owner, to be a man of faith, Stories have the ability to captivate us, to make us feel important because we're a part of those stories. Some of you have those stories of your own that you can say that perhaps you went to Hogwarts with Harry Potter. Fortunately for me, I never went to Hogwarts with Harry Potter because those books are really long. But the reality is we know a good story when we see it, when we read it. They become a part of who we are. It's one of the reasons why many of us, when we see a movie that's written after a book, made after a book that we love, we hate the movie because it, has, it's, it doesn't captivate what we had in our minds. So much so that when we see, oh, they're making that into a movie, oh no, they're going to ruin my childhood. Sometimes they do that with movies where they just remake them because nobody's got any new ideas anymore. The elements of a good story are simply four things. Setting, the what, the where, the when, the why. The conflict, the question, what are we going to do, what are we supposed to do? How are we going to overcome these, uh, these odds? The climax where we see the main event, the victory, the guy getting the girl, the love story, and the resolution of the, the moving forward. These elements of the story kind of help shape our understanding as we kind of go through it. And if you miss one of these, a lot of times you'll, you'll read a story that you're, and I talked about this last Sunday, about being 100 pages into a book and never not really knowing what it's about because the setting wasn't established. You read a book and you see no real conflict. And without conflict, a story is kind of boring. And then we all know that story that just kind of falls flat. It seems to build and build and build and then never quite reaches the pinnacle of that climax. And then sometimes we get the climax, but there's no real resolution. And we feel like the author just kind of stopped right before it was about to get good. When we come to the pages of Scripture, many of us, we approach this book. Many of you, like me, when I was a kid, I saw this book with fear of what I was not supposed to do and the punishments for what, what would happen to me if I did those things that I wasn't supposed to do. 
But as I got older, and I decided in my 20s to pick up this book and really read it, I found not a book of rules, but a book of stories. A book of stories about people who were a lot like me, who weren't perfect, who made mistakes, who didn't measure up, who fell short. And I found many of these things setting conflict, climax, and resolution right there in the pages of Scripture. And as I read them, I entered into that story. I slayed Goliath with David. I marched around Jericho with Joshua. I parted the Red Sea with Moses, and I became a part of that story. But the difference between the Bible and, say, my favorite book, Ender's Game, is that the Bible happens to be true. It happens to be a true story that when I am entering into it, I'm entering into not just an individual story, but a larger story of what God has been doing throughout history. I've been entering into a story that has been going on for thousands of years, and I'm entering into a story that is not just God's story, but in his grace has allowed it to become my story. That God has allowed it to become our story. So the stories that we read within the pages of Scripture are not just about people who lived thousands of years ago who are long since dead, but these are stories that we continue on today. Today we are beginning a new sermon series on stories, and we are looking at the book of Acts. And for the next few months, I hope to go through the book of Acts, and we're not going to go really deep into every single verse, but we're going to hit the high points, and we are going to tell the stories of the book of Acts. We're going to tell the stories as they happened. You see, the book of Acts isn't a new story. It's the continuation of an old one. I don't know if you know this, but the book of Acts is not a book on its own, but it is a sequel. It is a sequel to the book of Luke. Luke wrote about the life of Jesus. He was not a, a follower of Jesus at that time, but he wrote with stories that he heard from Jesus' disciples. He wrote about stories he heard probably from Jesus' mother. He wrote about stories, and he put them down on paper, and he wrote not just to anyone, but he wrote to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus, we're not really sure who he was, but he probably was a man of some influence in society. Luke wrote to persuade Theophilus that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah. The book of Luke is all about who Jesus was when he walked this earth, who his disciples were, the ragtag group of people that would later come to change the world by telling a story, a story about Jesus. And we come to the book of Acts, and we find not a new story, but a new chapter in an old story. A new story would start over, but this is a new chapter where we see what's next, what's coming, what will happen to Jesus, who had just risen from the dead, what will happen to his 11 disciples. And in the book of Acts, we read the stories, our stories, of the origin of the church that is being lived out today in this place and in other churches and people groups all around the world. We are continuing on of this story. So what are the elements of this story? Setting. It is a changing culture rooted in Judaism. Jesus came to provide a new way to open up access to God. A changing culture where his disciples are now 
telling people about Jesus in a new way, that you don't have to be Jewish, you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to sacrifice, but the final sacrifice has been made. But then there's this other group of people that is holding on to the past saying, no, you cannot do that. And there's conflict. In the first chapter of Acts, we see our first conflict. Jesus rose from the dead, but now what? What will happen now? And we'll see as they wrestle with that. But we know that Jesus' time at that point was drawing to a close on earth. And that he would ascend into heaven and the disciples would be alone. What would they do? We find a climax in Jesus' final instructions. And we see some resolution as they are resolved to do what Jesus tells them to do. I'd like to focus on, in chapter 1, just on six through 11. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 6 through 11. 1 through 5 really sets the stage. Luke tells us what this book will be about, who it's written to. It talks about what has happened in a sense and what is coming. 6 through 11 is really our conflict and the climax of what is coming. So let's go ahead and read. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this story continues Jesus' ministry on earth. Jesus' ministry on earth was to come to heal the sick, to establish his ministry, establish who he was, but most importantly, to die on the cross for the sins as the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. His ministry on earth has come to an end, but now he is passing the baton, so to speak, to his disciples who will continue the story who will continue the ministry that he kept on. And when we think about it, every single one of us sitting in this room today who has found our place in God's story, who has found our place in Jesus, can trace our story back through the generations all the way back to those 11 men standing on a hill, staring into heaven, who are now resolved to take the gospel to the nations. And they told others, who told others, who told others and passed down the stories through the generation as Luke wrote them down. Paul wrote letters. James wrote letters. John and his other disciples, they wrote books. And they were passed down from generation to generation. And we've heard these stories and we've received these stories. And all of us today can trace our story back to the book of Acts. How awesome is that? That even though our names may not be here, our story begins here. Our story begins here. So what we have to do is find the place where his story becomes your story. We have to find that place where his story becomes my story, your story, our story. Why is that so important? Because if we can't find our place in this story, it will never be real to us. It will just be pages in a book. But when it becomes our story, your story, my story, then we tell that story. And we change the world with a story that is not a new story, but is an old story. So let's look at this story. What is the setting of this story? 
The setting of this story is 11 men standing on a hill. They don't know what's coming. You see, they had something else in mind. Even their very first question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, establishes what they have in their mind. They know the prophecies of the Old Testament that the Messiah would come and sit on the throne of David and would restore Israel to prominence, would overthrow the tyranny of the oppression that they were facing. They thought it was Rome that he would be overthrown. They didn't realize that it was the oppression of sin. So what do you do? What do you do when the story takes an unexpected turn? In movies and books, we love this. We love something where we expected one thing, but then all of a sudden it goes in a different direction because it makes it interesting, and that's what happens here. They were expecting that now Jesus would take his rightful place as king of Israel and they would maybe get their places of prominence. But that wasn't what it was. You see, that was not what they were going to be doing. In fact, what they were going to be doing was simply continuing what he had already started. They would go out and they would heal the sick. They would give sight to the blind. They would cast out demons. And they would tell people about this Jesus that they followed. And they would tell his stories. And they would tell the stories that they were a part of. And people would enter into those stories. But they didn't quite know that. These 11 men. There were 12. But we remember what happened to Judas Iscariot. They're standing on a hill. Wondering. What's next? What's next? After all we've been through, what's next? And we have our conflict. The first conflict that they'll face, and it's not the last in the book of Acts, will be this concept of, what do you mean, Jesus? You're not going to be here anymore. As they sit and they watch him raise up into the clouds, out of their sight, what must they have been thinking? Can you put yourself on that hill, staring up into heaven? You had walked with Jesus for three years. He was your friend, your mentor. You watched him die on a cross. You feel the grief that they must have felt. And then the overwhelming sense of joy when you see that he is alive on Easter morning. He's risen from the dead. He is alive. What joy you must have felt, but now he's leaving again. This isn't what I had in mind. This isn't the story I had in mind. The story I had in mind was so much different, but you're leaving This is a reality check in many of our lives. Many of us have stories of our own that go a certain way that we weren't expecting. Sometimes it's tragic. We think, gosh, this is the direction I'm going, but tragedy hits. And one of the things that Richard talked about, about some of the clients that he works with, of bad choices that have been made, and if you think, if you go back in each one of our own stories, was there one choice that we could have made differently that could have ended us up at the Global Center for Success? How much different are we? We're just one or two choices different. In many of us, that is our story of overcoming that uncertainty, that conflict. Many of us, we've experienced the joy and the presence of Christ in our lives in worship. Many of us, that first time that we gave our lives to Jesus and we prayed a prayer, maybe as a child, and we felt the overwhelming sense of God in our lives and believing that we could do anything because Christ was with us. And then we face those obstacles in our life where we wonder, where is Jesus? Where is God? Why has he abandoned me? I thought that we would be this together, and 
we miss sometimes what God is doing in our lives. I don't know what the disciples were thinking. Pentecost was just around the corner. The Holy Spirit would come. Did they know that? They'd been told this, but did they know it? Or were they focused in on what was happening in that moment, wondering, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? Jesus doesn't leave them in too much suspense because really the main event of chapter 1 is his instructions. The main thing that he wants to tell them in verse 8, the task at hand. You want to know what's next? This is what's next. You want to know what you're supposed to do? This is what you're supposed to do. I may not be with you, but I am sending help. And he's told them before that the help that would come would be better than having him with them. Verse 80 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Just think about that. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people to do certain tasks, but it wasn't permanent. In fact, with King Saul, we saw the Holy Spirit come upon him and then later on depart from him. But Jesus promised that this would be permanent. The Holy Spirit would give them power. What kind of power? They had seen power. They had seen the power of Jesus working through people, healing the sick again, standing before the rulers, the teachers, the scholars, and with power rebuking them teaching them about what the scriptures really mean. They had seen power. Now they will receive that power. I don't know, but that, that seems exciting to me. As you're standing there, you're saying, we're going to receive the Holy Spirit to do powerful things. When? Not really told when. When? But I would have been excited. I would have been waiting anxiously for that moment when the Holy Spirit would come upon me and I would do the work that God had called me to do. They look forward to us and see us living in today with the Holy Spirit. And they probably at that moment looked at us with envy, knowing that we already have what they were just waiting for. The rest of the book of Acts we would see that power. We would see that power come out as they did powerful things. And I wonder sometimes, do we as followers of Jesus today believe that we have the same power that they did in the first century? If we did, would our lives look different? Would we wait in anxious anticipation as we get to use that power each and every day? They would receive power. But what are they to do with that power? And then it comes. And you will be my witnesses. Witnesses. This is a courtroom term. Witness gives testimony in a case. And what is testimony if not the telling of a story? The telling of a story that is no, no doubt true, that is no doubt real about the things that have happened, the things that you have seen, but you will be my witnesses. And then what comes next will, will be the setting for the remainder of the book of Acts as it is divided into these three sections. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Right well, they were on a hill next to Jerusalem, so right there, you will be my witnesses there. You will start there. You will do your miracles there. You will testify by your actions and your words who I am, who Jesus is. You will start there in the marketplace. You will do miracles. 
in the synagogues, in the temple courtyard. You will show my power. The very things that you do will testify to me, to Jesus. Your very lives will be a story about who I am. And for the rest of eternity until Jesus comes back and well into eternity, those stories will continue to be told. They caused quite a bit of commotion in Jerusalem. So much so that the the rulers didn't know what to do with these people. But in a couple chapters, you'll see that they noticed. They didn't know what these people were about. They knew they were unlearned men. They had never been to college. They were rejected in the early parts of their schooling, forced to go and be a part of the family business. There's nothing wrong with that, but they were not knowledgeable. They were not geniuses, but they were doing these things and they were teaching with authority And one of those leaders took notice that these men had been with Jesus. And I wonder, when people look at your life, when they look at your story, can they tell that you've been with Jesus? Let me ask you, are you a witness for Jesus in your Jerusalem? Where is your Jerusalem? Is it your home with your family? Think about the stories that your life tells your family. Think about the story that your life tells your kids. Your kids, and I think I'm beginning to realize this, read you like a book. What story are you telling them? Is it a comedy? For me, I've always wanted to be funny. I'm just not. Every once in a while, I'll say something to my wife as a joke, and she says, that was actually funny. (laughs) Emphasis on the word actually, as in out of the norm. But I'll tell you one thing, I can make my five-year-old laugh. I can make her laugh, even if it's by tickling her, I can make her laugh. I want her to laugh. I want my story to be one that is funny. I want my family to read my story And I want it to be a story where I am not the main character, but I am simply being used by God who is the main character. You think about that. If you were to tell your story, what part would God play? Is God supporting cast? Is he just an extra? Or is he the main character? Your Jerusalem can also be your community. This past week, I was very, let's just say convicted that I don't really know my neighbors. We've lived there over six months. I've met them a couple times. I don't know my neighbors. I need to change that. When they look at me, what do they see? What story do they see? But if I'm not open to them reading my story by looking at my life, then I'm missing it. Focus on your Jerusalem first. Focus on your immediate surroundings because that's where God is going to bring the most opportunities for you to tell your story. And then he tells them, And then all of Judea and Samaria. Now, Judea and Samaria were kind of like, if Jerusalem was your hometown, then it branches out a little bit more, and you have Judea, which is kind of like the state. You know, Israel is a country just like the United States. In each individual province, there are multiple towns, and Judea was kind of the main province that Jerusalem was in. So for us, that might be... For those of us who live in Vallejo and Benicia and American Canyon, well, American Canyon is Napa County, but um, Benicia, Vallejo, we're in Solano County. 
And then maybe we have Samaria. Maybe that's California. Maybe it's the United States. Maybe that's the home missions. We tell our stories there. And I think this is where the church comes in. Because we're not just individuals living our own stories on our own, but we're part of a family of faith here in North Hills. This is all of our stories. And what story does North Hills tell to the city of Vallejo, to Solano County? What does the city look at us and say, okay, that's what they're about? Is it Jesus? Is it a place of worship? Or is it a people that love and care for the city, who love and care for people who don't look like them, who don't talk like them maybe, who don't even believe like they do, who have different lifestyles. Do they love the city? The disciples and the early church stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed in Jerusalem and didn't really venture too far out. And then the persecutions came, the conflict came, and it forced them to spread out. It forced them to spread out to places like Samaria. Samaria not being exactly the place that you would expect the gospel to go. Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. But the story went to them as well because that story wasn't just a Jewish story, but it was a humanity story. It was a story not just for people who looked like them and talked like them, but was a story for all of humanity. When we think about Vallejo, we think about this area of the country, it is one of the most diverse communities in all of the country. In fact, I've heard it said on multiple occasions that it is. I can't verify that. But I know by walking around and looking, the city of Vallejo is very diverse. When we talk about the ends of the earth, which is where we go next, how amazing is it that the ends of the earth have come to us? And the story of Christ can be told to nations of the earth right here. As people who come from other countries hear the gospel, and what happens? They take it back to their country. They take our story with them as it becomes their story. And as we see, as the book of Acts goes on, it ends in the ends of the earth. The story goes all the way as far as Spain, goes all the way to Rome, where people of the household of Caesar are putting their trust in Christ. Why? Because they're finding their place in his story. His story is becoming their story. And it all started here. You fast forward a couple hundred years, and before long, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. Why? Because his disciples went. They went and they told the world about Jesus. They told the story. And people responded to it because it was a story that was captivating. It was a story that they could immerse themselves in. But I want to stress that my guess is that they were captivated by the story because the people telling it were captivated by the story. Jesus' disciples, that early group of 11, plus women and children and others who were following, probably that first time they met together, probably 120, they're ballooning to 3,000 on Pentecost. They were captivated by the story. It was their story, and they told it with passion. They told it with vigor, and they told it with a sense of urgency that I think that we in the American church have somewhat lost. We read these pages of scripture and we say, you will be my witnesses, we see. Is that pastors and missionaries? No, that's everyone. All of us. Acts 1-8 is the climax 
of this section and will set the stage for the rest of the book of Acts. But then something interesting happens. We get to a resolution, but not the kind of resolution that we would expect. But it is a resolution nonetheless. What I find interesting as you read through 12 through 26, the rest of the chapter, it's really, there's not a whole lot of action. You would think, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power, you will change the world with the story of the gospel. You would think that they would go out into the streets and start telling it, but they don't. They wait. They get ready. They get prepared. There's an old prophecy that they remember related to Judas Iscariot that somebody has to take his place. So they're like, well, who's going to take his place? They go and find a man named Matthias. They go and they choose Matthias to take his office. His office. Verse 12. After this, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. When they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Rather than going out, immediately telling the world about Jesus, they stopped and they waited and they prepared, and they got ready. They prayed. You see, they couldn't do anything yet, and I think they knew that. You see, they knew that a time would come when they would receive power by the Holy Spirit, but that was not now. So what did they do? They prayed. But I would like you to think, after Jesus was crucified, what did they do? They scattered. They went back to fishing. They went back to their hometowns. They scattered. Jesus goes up into heaven. What do they do? They stayed together. The bonds that they had formed bound them together, and those relationships remained solid. They stayed with each other. They ate with each other. They prayed with each other. They were devoted to one another. And their names are listed here. Prayer is so important, and I think something that we miss a lot. We get an idea in our head that we need to move forward with this. And what do we do? We move forward, but we forgot to pray. When we move forward without praying, we move forward in a story that is not God's. We move forward in a story that is ours. But when we stop to pray, we stop to make sure we say, God, is this your story? And then we get affirmation, we move forward. I've often heard families that pray together stay together. And often that's your biological family, your husband, your wife, your kids, your grandparents, your grandkids. But I think it applies to the church as well. Are we a family of God that is praying together, who is telling each other our stories, We devoted to one another as the disciples were here. They were devoted to each other because they saw a huge task ahead of them. A story that had to be told, but they had no power yet. They had no words yet. They had no actions yet. All they had was each other. And they rested in that. They prepared to move forward. And for many of us, this is no great resolution. But the reality is that in many great stories, there isn't a real resolution, but there is possibility. You ever watch the love story where the guy gets the girl? You see the wedding, but you don't see the marriage. We're left to wonder, do they make it on our just in our own minds. 
even in stories where great victories are won, even in true stories, stories of World War I, we see the great victory. There's resolution, but we know that World War II is just a few years away. We see great stories of overcoming, but we know more conflict is ahead. We may not see it. The story of Acts is one that revo- resolves in possibility. Possibility in a better future. Possibility in a relationship with God. Apart from having to sacrifice a bull and a goat. Bringing your grain offerings. But one that rests on the solid rock of Christ. That is our story. That is the story that is here. But I have another question. What is your story? What is your story? I want you to imagine they're making a movie about your life. What is the plot? You can't fit 70 years in an hour and a half. What is the plot? What is the major point in your story? What is that setting? What is that conflict that you overcame? What is the climax of it? And how does it resolve? Who are the characters? Obviously, there's you. But who else is in the story? Is there a spouse that stood by you? Is there kids that you take joy in? What adversity did you overcome? Before I became a pastor, I worked at an organization called the National Fatherhood Initiative, and my boss was one of the greatest men I had ever met. He was a man of amazing faith, but he told me his story of growing up in the ghetto of Toledo, Ohio. Now, I don't know if you know too much about Toledo, Ohio, but it is not a good place to live. It may not be South L.A., but it is not a great place to live. But he worked hard. He dodged gangs. He got immersed in football. He got a full scholarship to play Division I. He made something of himself. He was excited about where he had come from where he had been. But you know what? That wasn't his story. The great adversity that he overcame wasn't his story. His story was in his relationship with Jesus Christ. His story was in the relationship that was possible by the shed blood of Christ on the cross. What is your story? Yesterday I went to a retirement party for another great man of God. He was the worship pastor at at Trinity Baptist Church in Livermore where I served for nearly seven years. He was a mentor to me. He was with me through some pretty tough times in ministry. He was retiring after 39 years at one church. And I'm thinking, wouldn't that be awesome? 39 years at one church. I'm thinking, 39 years? I'm not sure a church could put up with me for 10 years. 39 years. But again, his story is not staying at a church for 39 years, but the relationship that he has with Christ. The fact that Christ's story took hold of him in such a way that it made it his story. What is your story? And then I want you to think, who do you want to see your story? Who do you want to read your story? Who needs to hear it? The reality is is that your story is not your story. It's his story. And our story, as it connects to God's story, has to be told. It has to be told to the next generation. It has to be told to our families, to our kids. And I know in many cases you've 
feel like that sounds very self-centered to tell your story. But your story will give strength to somebody else. Your story will give strength to the next generation. Your story will be so captivating when people see how tethered it is to Christ that they will join in to your story and meet Jesus. Are you willing to tell your story? Are you willing to let other people come in to your story? You may say, well, I don't have a story. I had a youth group girl one time. We were talking about giving personal testimonies, and she said, J Pastor James, my testimony is boring. I grew up in the church. I've never really strayed from God. Yes, I've had my struggles, but I believe in him with my whole heart, and I want to live my life for him. What's exciting about that? And I said, everything. Do you know how many people who have struggled through life, who have come to a point of brokenness before they can accept Christ, would kill for your story? You have the greatest story of all. You have overcome so much to have that story. Don't ever look down on your story and don't ever let anybody else look down on your story. Tell that story, especially to the younger generation who have the opportunity to duplicate it. What is your story? Over the next few months, I'd like to give all of us the opportunities to tell our stories. In two weeks, we are going to be launching life groups, small groups that will meet in homes, that will meet in coffee shops. And the purpose of these groups will not necessarily to be to dive into the deep theological truths of Scripture, while that will be a part of it, but the purpose of these will be to tell each other our stories. How did you become a follower of Jesus? What do you struggle with? What have you overcome? What are the things that you need prayer for? These groups, we will meet through the summer. We will commit to each other through the summer. And my encouragement to you is simply to ask the question, why not? On May 7th after church, as an extension of the service, we'll go over into Dodson Hall. We will have lunch together. We'll have small group leaders, life group leaders who will be there. We'll have groups for men, for women, for young, for seasoned. We'll have groups for people who are seeking, and we'll have groups for people who just want somebody to hear their story. As we move towards that, and I hope that this isn't coming as a surprise because we've been moving this direction for the last year. And I hope that you will see this as valuable, not necessarily about what you'll get out of it, but what somebody else will get out of your story. So in the next two weeks, you'll hear more about this as we move forward with this, because this is how our stories will be told in small groups groups that see themselves not as individuals going through life alone, but as people who are part of a bigger story. So you'll get more information about that as we move forward. But just ask yourself, why not? We'll find a group that fits your schedule, that fits your needs, and a place that you can belong. So with that, let's enter into a time of reflection. And I really want you to think deeply about what is the main event of your story? What story is your life all about? And who needs to see it? So as the band comes up, we'll spend a few minutes in reflection, and then we'll come up to close the service. Father God, we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you that we are a part of a bigger story. We pray that each one of us would find our purpose and our place in your story.
And may we tell the story of what you've done in our lives to a world that needs to hear it. We thank you that we're a part of your story. In Jesus' name, amen.